One of the leading causes of crashes in small aircraft is an aerodynamic stall on final approach. Pilots who don't monitor their speed can end up going too slow for the air to support them. But this kind of crash is almost unheard of in passenger airliners. That's why the case of Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 is so baffling. How could a modern passenger jet, like the 737 involved in this crash, stall and plummet to the ground on final approach just one and a half kilometers from one of Europe's busiest airports? As this episode will uncover, a failure of one of the aircraft systems would reveal a host of psychological weaknesses in the cockpit. This story raises questions about how humans interact with technology and about who's in charge when the gap between man and machine broadens. It also explores the disturbing role that Boeing may have played in covering up their responsibility for the crash. On February 25th, 2009, Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 departed Istanbul Atatürk Airport in Turkey, bound for Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. There were 128 passengers on board and seven crew. The flight was a special one for the first officer, Murat Cezer. He had only completed 17 flights since joining Turkish Airlines and had never flown to Amsterdam before. Because of this, both he and his captain were accompanied by a safety pilot who was sitting in the jump seat. This man, Olge Özgür, was there to help the pilots with their increased workload and to ensure that this new team adhered to procedures. The pilots didn't fully appreciate it yet, but their workload was going to be higher still on this flight. The captain's radio altimeter, which measures the height of the aircraft above the ground, was malfunctioning. No matter how high they were above the ground, this instrument read minus 8 feet. However strange this was, it should have been a minor issue. After all, the first officer's instrument was functioning normally. The flight proceeded as normal as the aircraft climbed into the skies above Eastern Europe for its three and a half hour flight to Amsterdam. To understand the sequence of events which will happen on final approach, let's take a moment to understand how the radio altimeter links in with the autopilot. In the last few seconds before a plane touches down on the runway, it needs to pitch up slightly to slow its rate of descent so it lands more softly. This manoeuvre, when the plane pitches up slightly, is known as a flare. When the pilots flare close to landing, they also reduce the engine thrust back to idle, so the plane continues to descend even when it's pitching up. Like most modern passenger aircraft, the autopilot on the 737-800 can land the plane itself. However, autopilots are quite basic machines, and they rely on a few key pieces of information in order to make sure that the aircraft is in fact about to land. On the 737, the autopilot needs to know three things to confirm this. First, it needs to know that no target altitude is selected on the autopilot panel. This ensures that the pilots are aiming to be on the runway and not at, say, 20,000 feet. The autopilot also needs to know that the flaps are set at an angle greater than 12.5 degrees, which is only found when the aircraft is close to landing. And finally, it needs to know that the altitude above the ground is less than 27 feet, meaning that the plane is right above the runway. Once these three criteria are met, the autopilot will bring the engines back to idle so that the flare can be executed correctly. If you have a think about the captain's faulty altimeter mentioned a few moments ago, you might see where this is going. Let's go back to the flight. At a quarter past 10 in the morning, as the aircraft descended through 8,000 feet in the skies above the Netherlands, an audio alert sounded in the cockpit. This indicated that the landing gear was not down, despite the aircraft thinking that it should be. The captain correctly identified that this false warning appeared because the plane was getting its altitude information from the broken radio altimeter, which indicated that the aircraft was eight feet below the ground. He pointed this out to the other crew members, and they continued their approach into Amsterdam. They started making their preparations for landing, and the captain contacted Turkish Airlines ground handling company to tell them how many passengers were on board and to ask where the plane was to park after landing. Apart from the nuisance radio altimeter, there was one other small problem. As we will see, these two issues will combine in the most unfortunate way, which in a matter of seconds will cause the deaths of nine people on board and injure over a hundred others. The airspace around Schiphol is one of the busiest in the world. As a result of this, controllers regularly clear pilots for shorter approaches in order to save time. A consequence of this is that the aircraft sometimes make their final turn towards the runway when they are quite high. Typically, a plane will intercept the ideal glide path from below and slowly make a descent towards the runway. On this day, however, Turkish 1951 will have to intercept the glide path from above. This requires the pilots to descend more quickly than normal, in what is known as a slam dunk approach. To achieve this, the first officer, who was flying the aircraft, enabled the vertical speed mode of the autopilot, which controls how fast the plane climbs or descends. He set a descent rate of 1400 feet per minute in order to intercept the glide slope. This is about twice the standard descent rate for this stage of flight, but this procedure was not hugely uncommon at Schiphol. When this mode was selected, however, all three criteria for the autopilot to initiate the flare maneuver were fulfilled. As a result, the autothrottle brought the engine thrust back to idle, thinking that the plane was just seconds from touchdown. 
The pilots didn't notice that the autopilot had gone into flare mode because they fully expected the thrust levers to go back to idle, as this is what would normally happen when they asked the aircraft to descend quickly. The pilots now had less than 60 seconds to notice that the aircraft's computers had a completely false picture of where the aircraft was. At 10.25, the plane intercepted the glide path from above. Now the plane was back on a normal vertical course, and it needed to increase thrust to maintain the shallower descent rate. However, the aircraft's computers still thought that the plane was just above the runway, so they didn't push the throttles forwards. Instead, in order to not fall below the glide slope, the autopilot started to raise the nose of the aircraft. As a result of this, the speed started beating away. In less than a minute, the aircraft would stall. Meanwhile, the captain and first officer were completing the before landing checklist. Their attention was focused on other parts of the cockpit as they prepared the plane for landing, and they didn't notice the speed dropping or the nose rising. With about one minute to go until landing, and less than 500 feet above the ground, the stick shaker activated, indicating that the aircraft was about to stall and fall from the sky. The safety pilot warned the crew about the airspeed, which was now 107 knots, well below the correct approach speed of 144 knots. The first officer immediately pushed the engine throttles forwards and pushed the nose down to prevent a stall, but then the captain announced that he was taking over control of the plane. The first officer let go of the controls, and the autopilot immediately brought the engine thrust back to idle. The captain continued pushing the nose down and shortly afterwards pushed the throttles to their full stop. The aircraft didn't have enough altitude to recover from the stall, however. Just 15 seconds after the stall warning sounded, the aircraft slammed into a field just one and a half kilometers short of the runway. The aircraft split into three pieces on impact and came to rest just a short distance from where it first hit the ground. The three pilots were killed in the crash, as well as one cabin crew member and five passengers. 117 passengers were injured, many severely. The passengers who were able to immediately exited the aircraft through the doors and the holes in the fuselage. They began to stagger away from the wreckage, fearing an explosion. 60 ambulances arrived on the scene and rushed almost 100 passengers to hospital. Shortly afterwards, survivors' accounts of the crash to the media immediately revealed the main cause of the accident, an aerodynamic stall just as the plane was coming into land. Passengers described how the plane simply dropped like a stone and how it felt as if it had fallen into a void. Yet this was a modern passenger aircraft, and in this case, there was even a safety pilot on board. Why did the pilots not notice the impending stall, and what role did the radio altimeter have to play? The investigation into the crash, which was conducted by the Dutch Safety Board, uncovered that Boeing had been made aware of the consequences of a faulty radio altimeter on the autopilot back as far as 2004. Five cases had been reported where 737 aircraft entered the flare mode erroneously while on approach. In each of these cases, the crew noticed the mistake within seconds and took back control of the aircraft. Boeing issued a software fix in 2006 to rectify this issue, but it only applied to aircraft built after 2006. The Turkish Airlines 737 involved in this crash was built in 2002, and so could not avail of the software update. Boeing didn't consider this to be a safety issue, however, because pilots could simply disable the autothrottle and fly the plane themselves when this occurred. Indeed, that's exactly what the 12 crews who experienced this issue up to the accident flight in 2009 had done. In fact, many more crews had experienced this issue, but their reports had not made it to Boeing. As a result of this, the final report into the accident recommended that reporting mechanisms be improved so that the true extent of problems can be known to airline manufacturers like Boeing before they cause accidents. The question still remains as to why the crew of this flight failed to notice the impending stall. If anything, this flight should have been safer than the others, with a safety pilot on board as well as the usual crew of two. Research carried out in the 1990s had found that Boeing pilots, unlike their Airbus counterparts, tend not to actively monitor which mode the autopilot or autothrottle is in. Here's a picture from a study carried out a few years before the crash, which used eye tracking helmets to see where pilots looked during a typical flight. The dots in this picture represent places where a pilot fixed his gaze during a one hour flight. As you can clearly see, he almost never looked at the FMA, which is the part of the screen where autopilot modes are displayed. This is not the fault of pilots themselves, but of their training, which does not require that they monitor changes in automation mode. Other research had also suggested that the modern digital display of airspeed is less intuitive than the old-fashioned airspeed dials, which can be glanced at out of the corner of one's eye and understood visually without any additional mental work. The investigation also focused on the pilot's decision to continue the approach despite the fact that they did not meet the criteria for a stabilised approach as per company procedures. These procedures dictated that pilots must abandon an approach if the landing checklist is not complete by 1,000 feet above the ground, or if the throttle levers were in the wrong position, or if the speed is too high. In this case, none of these criteria were fulfilled on this flight, and yet the pilots continued their approach. This is not unusual, however. Pilots tend to continue approaches regardless of whether they have met the official criteria for a stabilised approach. The only criteria they tend to follow is the one in their minds, which is, is there any reason that this landing is obviously not going to work? 
This is a clear example of where the procedures set down by regulators and airlines do not take human nature into account. However, this is where another small abnormality in this flight came into play. The pilots started their descent high, and so when they tried to intercept the glide slope from above, and the autothrottles engaged flare mode, they assumed that the reduced engine thrust was simply the autothrottle attempting to slow the plane down during its faster than normal descent. This unfortunate timing would not have been present on the at least a dozen other cases where pilots did notice that the flare mode had been erroneously engaged. Ultimately, the cause of this crash was neither pilot error nor automation malfunction. Rather, it was an unfortunate combination of the two. This crash highlights how seemingly small errors can combine in the worst possible way, leading to a deadly outcome. As a result of this crash, Boeing issued a warning that erroneous radio altimeter readings could lead to the autopilot entering flare mode. Turkish Airlines also added training for pilots on how to recover from low altitude stalls. The final report recommended that this training become a part of all airline pilot simulator training. An interesting development in this story happened in 2020, when a New York Times investigation claimed that Boeing had successfully strong-armed the Dutch Safety Board into minimising Boeing's role in the accident. The New York Times investigation claimed that the Dutch Safety Board, in its final report, excluded and downplayed criticisms of Boeing, instead focusing primarily on the role that the pilots played in the accident. The Dutch Safety Board denied this charge, but you can be the judge of whether this denial holds any weight. Last year, a new inquiry was launched into the crash, in which both Boeing and the US National Transportation Safety Board refused to participate. The results of this new inquiry remain to be seen. If you found this video interesting, subscribe for weekly air crash documentaries. Let me know in the comments if there are any air accidents or incidents you'd like to see covered, and I'll do my best to feature them in future videos. Thanks again for watching.